Welcome, everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And I'm Maria Ott, and I'm the proud holder um, of the Irving R. and Virginia A. Malbo Chair in Education Administration. And I am honored to welcome everyone and appreciate you being here. I know how busy everyone is at this time of the year and just really appreciate you making the time to be here for the lecture. Um, we are gonna have an amazing discussion about leading in times of radical change and finding common ground. I think we all desire you know, to find common ground so this is the second lecture that brings us together to continue the, lega the leadership legacy of Dean Irving R. Malbo. Last year's theme was leading in times of radical change, invitation to lead for a new future. And it focused on leadership post-pandemic. This year, we focus on our current realities and seek ways to find common ground. So I am honored to welcome you again, and now I'm going to introduce um, some of our distinguished guests. From our Board of Counselors, we have Maggie Chidester. Maggie, please stand. <laughs> Gary Crisp, thank you for being here. <laughs> Carol Fox. Lynn Jacobson, Mary James, Patricia Brent Sanko, a great team that supports our dean. And we have some VIPs. We have uh, Laura Tyndall Wagner. Um, I haven't seen Laura yet. Is she, has she arrived? Well, we welcome her anyway. She'll, she's coming in, I gather, gather, and then Richard Tyndall, and then Bob Ferris. Um, Bob, where are you? So it is also my pleasure and honor to acknowledge our USC Rossier faculty. They could stand, just stand faculty, and our DSAG members. We have the strongest faculty. I'd put them up against any university in the nation. Um, and our DSAG group do so much to support our scholarships and the work on behalf of our students. Um, could I just ask everyone, as we start off, to give us a fight on to kind of get us in the spirit? <laughs> fight on, everyone. <laughs> OK. We do have a distinguished panel of experts who are gonna share their wisdom and advice with all of you on a topic that will add tools to your uh, leadership toolkit um, and the roles that you have in your diverse um, locations. So the complete bio of, for each speaker is in the QR code, okay? This is technology, this is current uh, best practice, so the QR code is on your table um, and that code also includes details for today's event. So if you want to see how the flow is, click on to the QR code. We are going to also have a reception following the lecture, so we hope that you will stay for networking, um, take a beverage together, and enjoy the hors d'oeuvres, and also get to interact with our speakers that you're going to hear today. So I, I encourage you to please uh, make time for that later. So let me introduce our speakers. Um, I will ask them each to stand, and I'll list them by, in alphabetical order. So we'll begin with Leslie Bruinton, Executive Vice President, Nichols Strategies. And <laughs> welcome, Leslie. So glad you made it. She had to fly here from the East Coast, but we're so happy you're here. And Vivian Ekjian, superintendent retired of the Glendale Unified School District. <laughs> and a longtime dear friend. Stephen Nichols, founder and CEO of Nichols Strategies. 
Pedro Nogueira, Dean, USC Ross Sears School of Education, best dean in the nation, and Eric Olson, Executive Director, Communications for USC Ross Sears. So this lecture builds on the leadership legacy of Dean Irving R. Malpo, who was a trailblazer. No surprise, right, as a Trojan. He understood that USC's School of Education could be a leader not only in California, but in the nation. And he actually did international work. Let's hear about his legacy. Um, watch a short clip. The Melbo Lecture Series is important both to honor and remember Melbo and, and his work, but also to continue that work. Dean Melbo had a vision for the School of Education that we're living today. That vision that he had for being a school that produces great leaders that serve throughout the state and throughout the nation, really. Irving was a person who established a strong program for practitioners. We often take great pride at uh, Rossier that we produce so many educational leaders, and that's due to the legacy of, of Melbo. My grandmother Virginia and my grandpa Irving were really wonderful people. They spent a lot of time investing themselves into other people. This lecture is really exciting for us. It's something that is visible and tangible. I mean, we're at this point right now in education where we've come from a very static way of operating our systems to being totally disrupted. The lecture series is important because it gives us an opportunity to come together and to talk about really important topics. Sharing expertise, sharing ideas, sharing possibilities. These are very difficult times for educational leaders. We prepare the next generation of leaders by being in touch with the challenges facing leaders. I'm hoping that with the title of the lecture, carrying his name, the, the two Melbos, that people will realize that we're growing from the roots of our past and growing to a new future. Um, just gathering together to hear a panel of speakers is such a delight after what, uh, everything that we've been through. So it's an exciting new chapter for all of us and we're so proud and, and honored to be a part of it. I think they would be really honored that their legacy is a part of this story that continues to change and adapt. I have loved being an educator my entire career. I get energy from this next generation of educators that are really shaping what will be as we go forward. We're really proud that uh, we continue to produce uh, leaders uh, who are out there on the front lines of education making a difference, sometimes in very underserved communities, but often with the vision and the resourcefulness to really do great work. So proud that our school is, stands as the tallest building and uh, that we can look out on all that is USC. So building on Dean Malbo's legacy, um, let's set the tone for the lecture today. There's a real thick book called The Malbo Years, and in it, um, Irving Malbo is described as calling for a leader who knows the reality of politics, who understands how confidence is gained and destroyed, and how cooperation is enlisted and rewarded. He envisioned the educational statesperson who could live and work in a negative environment. And we are facing a negative environment that leads us to acknowledge that these are times of radical change. So connecting to Malbo's theme of knowing our reality, we must learn to navigate the opportunities and the threats that we face. We must know how to build bridges of trust and respect with our public. And we need to do that through respectful discourse. So we see examples that undermine the confidence that Malbo advised is foundational to leadership and influence. And we saw, see examples that cause us to pause and reflect. And I often say, how is that possible? Um, 
So the respect for divergent points of view is core to our democracy, and courageous conversations bring us together to share differences of opinion and to explore where we have common ground. So we begin by hearing from an expert who has thought deeply about this topic, and he's going to share his wisdom with us. Pedro A. Noguera is the Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops Dean of the Ross Sears School of Education. And along with his extensive publications, we are focused today on his book titled A Search for Common Ground, Conversations About the Toughest Questions in K-12 Education. And if you were one of the early arrivers, you got a copy of that book. Dean Noguera, how do we find common ground? Our children are relying on us to create a future characterized by respect for differences and value for what holds us together as a society and a nation. Please join me in welcoming Dean Noguera. Good afternoon. And thank you all for being with us today. Uh, you know, in the past, we, we put on so many great events, and sometimes we don't get the turnout. I said, it's like throwing a big party and uh, no one there to celebrate. But today we have, I think, a great turnout. So thank you. Maria, thank you for your leadership. When we thought about this chair and who on our faculty, we have a lot of distinguished scholars on our faculty. Uh, we said, who really epitomizes this leadership? Maria didn't talk about her own background, but she's been a superintendent. She's led some of the largest systems in the country. So we said we have a proven leader right here in our midst, and Maria, you really have lived up to ever, all of our expectations. So thank you. Thank, I want to thank the Board of Counselors. <laughs> thank our Melbo Committee. Uh, and, uh, and just say that uh, it's really an honor to be with you and talk about such an important issue. Um, some of you may have seen the article in the LA Times this Sunday about the political polarization um, that's infected schools across the country and driving many people out of the profession altogether. And one of the things the article let us know is that it's, this is a deliberate strategy. It's not just spontaneous. Uh, there are some who have decided that making war on superintendents and school boards is a good political agenda. Uh, and we know that as a result, lots of good people are leaving the profession. And that's a reason to be real concerned, because as we know, and it just came out today, the Smarter Balance scores were just released. Right? And what we see is that the pandemic took a toll on our kids, and we're seeing gaps and disparities like we've never seen that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, but they also get harder to address when our leaders are distracted by politics, distracted by attacks, and have to worry about the safety of their families in order to do their job. So we thought we need to address this topic because our goal at Ross here is to be a resource for the schools, for the leaders out there, the educators who are doing this work. We said, what better way to do that than to try to provide some guidance, some thought on how to approach this challenge. So let me start by saying that during periods of turbulence, it's so important to know what's guiding you. Where's the direction? Um, I thought about that a lot uh, when I was considering whether or not to uh, put my name in the hat to become dean at Rossier. I was ambivalent, to tell the truth, because I enjoyed being a professor. Professors have it a lot easier. Because <laughs> you don't have to make tough decisions. You don't have to do um, hard things, typically, as a professor. Um, and you have freedom to write and to teach and to do the things you like. So I loved that. Uh, and what really led me to think that this is something I should do was what happened on January 6th. Because as I was at home watching the Capitol in turmoil taken over, I said, wow, this is a time we need leaders. And not just in Washington. We need leaders across the country people of character who step up and are willing to lead because if we don't have leaders with clarity and vision, we're doomed as a nation. 
And I think all of us who have been in the field of education know that in education especially, leadership is critical. I've never been to a good school without a good leader. I've never seen a good functioning school district that didn't have a good, good leader. And most of us agree, education is key to our future as a nation. And so if we don't have good leaders in place, then our schools aren't going to have a chance of living up to the challenge of this moment. So I thought a lot about, OK, let me step forward. And it's not to say that being a, a dean of a school is the same as being a superintendent in turmoil. It's not the same. I'd say it's easier being the dean, right? although we have to still do hard things. And I had a bunch of them already this week, and it's only Wednesday. <coughs> but for me, a big part of leading at this time is understanding what I'm going to call moral leadership. Uh, I just got back from Finland, uh, where we was with a group of our students studying the education system. I'll say a little bit more about that later. And I uh, had trouble sleeping because of the 10 hour time difference. So I decided, let me listen to a lecture. And I heard a lecture on moral leadership. How timely. And this individual, whose name I can't forget because it was probably about 3 in the morning when I was listening, <laughs> said there were five important attributes of moral leadership. First, altruism. That is that you're motivated not by desire to get attention for yourself, but by your concern for others. Because to be a moral leader, or a leader who uh, inspires a sense of, of uh, inspiration around the mission, it is really ultimately about caring for others. And that made a lot of sense to me. It's also about integrity. What do you stand for? And are you willing to stand on the principle, on ethical principles of right and wrong, even when under attack, even when it's hard? Integrity is key. Empathy. And this, I think, particularly as we think about how do we talk to people we disagree with, to be able to see and recognize their humanity, even as we disagree, is so vital. It's what Rick and I did in that book. Because we disagree. We call it a search for common ground because sometimes we didn't find it. But every time, we respected each other, even as we disagreed. In fact, over the course of writing the book, we became friends. And friends doesn't mean we now agree on everything. Friends just means not only do we respect each other, we actually kind of like each other. Empathy, respect which is foundational to all of this work. And respect starts with self-respect, but it's also about acknowledging the dignity of others. From the custodian to the receptionist, everyone matters, everyone. And I always say, if you're a leader who treats those with the least power without respect, then you are not worthy of holding the position. Because everyone sees it. And it means they see through the hypocrisy. And then finally, it's about engagement, the willingness to act, not just to talk, but to do, to actually affect change. Because otherwise, we end up with good words, but nothing changes. And so to me, as I started thinking, well, who epitomizes moral leadership? First person to come to mind for me was Nelson Mandela. And Mandela came to mind for me because I was very active as a student in the anti-apartheid movement. And at one point, <clears throat> several years ago, I got to go to South Africa, which was in many ways a dream come true for me because I'd been so focused on what was happening in that country. And while there, I got to visit Robben Island. Robben Island is the island, the maximum security prison where Mandela and several others were held. He was held in prison for 27 years seven of those years in solitary confinement. And I was given a tour of the prison by a person who had been an inmate and served time with Mandela. As he showed us the cell where he slept on the cement, uh, cement slab, right? that's where Mandela was held. He said, they created this prison to destroy us. And it became known as our university. I said, 
well, how is that possible that a prison becomes a university? He said, well, people like me who had no education got our education here. Because people like Mandela and others who had education taught us. I said, well, what materials? He said, well, Mandela was so good, he befriended the guards. And this is one of the guards. This particular individual, Christo Brand, an Afrikaner, and they're not known for being particularly sympathetic to black people. His family was being evicted. And he knew that Mandela was a lawyer, so he went to Mandela and said, can you help me fight the eviction? And Mandela did, gave him legal counsel. And they forged an alliance because of that. And he started smuggling in books and materials for Mandela. And so Mandela had the ability to turn a person who could have really been his enemy into an ally. I want you to think about that, because when Mandela was released, first time in history that we know of, of a peaceful transition like this, where those with power gave up and those who had been held down assumed, you know, took the reins. Now, South Africa may not be what many of us hoped it would be today. But I don't blame Mandela for that. It takes more than one leader to change a country. It takes more than one leader to change a school system. So I think it's important for those of us who hold leadership roles to think and reflect, why are we doing this in the first place? Because it's too hard. Right, Vivian? <laughs> it's too hard. It's too, it's too much time. It's too much sacrifice. It's too much of a toll on your health. Too much time away from your family. Why are we doing this? What's your motivation? What's your North Star? I want you to think about that concept of the North Star. That's the Polaris, right? The um, star that navigators use to map the seas, to figure out where to go when their instruments aren't working. The Polynesians used it to navigate the Pacific in dugouts. In dugouts? That's pretty amazing. Harriet Tubman used the North Star to figure out how to escape from slavery. Just read a book about it. What? I mean, she went through the woods at night being chased 800 miles. The North Star. Where's your North Star? Because as a leader, when it's under attack, if you don't have clarity about what you're doing and why, easy to give up because it's not worth it after a while. And so it's important to think about how do we set priorities during periods like this? Share a quote from Hugh Vasquez with the National Equity Project. He says that disturbance is required for change. You gotta shake things up. And there's no doubt that disturbance is occurring. But the question is, are we willing to use this as an opportunity to create the kind of institutions we need and want. We have learned that if we are going to change the system, we first have to see what the system is producing. Then we have to engage with others to design something different. And finally, we have to act. The schools we have were designed to get the results they get now, perfectly. If we're not satisfied with the results, we have to be, figure out what needs to change. Can you see the system? It's not so easy, is it? Especially when you're immersed in it every day. Especially if you're not in the place where the most important work is occurring, the classroom. And many leaders aren't in the classroom. I always say the most important work in your school is happening in the classroom, and you're in your office. Kim Marshall, some of you may know him. He produced the Marshall Memo. It's a great digest for leaders, educational leaders. I used to visit him when he was the principal of the Mather School in Boston, one of the oldest schools in the country. He said, I have 30 teachers in my school. That means I have to see six teachers every day in order to, so I'm in there at least every classroom once in a week. That was his strategy. He said, they never know which one I'm going to come to because I mix it up. 
because I want to make sure they're teaching all the time. And I went with him to go into classrooms. And what I noticed is he wasn't focused on the teacher. He was focused on the students. Was there evidence of learning? Could the kids explain what they were doing? And because he was in classroom so often, he didn't have to stay that long, unless they weren't learning. Then he had to figure out why not. Leaders who are capable of producing the results we hope for figure out how to make themselves relevant to the work. He wasn't in there to scrutinize, to judge, or even to evaluate. He was there to help. Help with the most important work. And so when you think about leadership now, especially when there are so many distractions, the agitators at school board meetings, the people who, and a lot of times they're not even in your district. They're not even parents of your kids, but they're there. Making the lives of our educators more and more difficult if we're not clear about what matters, what our priorities are. It's so easy to not figure out how do we continue to do the work that matters most. So, I want to remind, how many of you are leaders in some role in a district? Got lots of them here today. You know, how do you make sure that your vision is a shared vision? Because if you're the only one who has it, then it's not really a vision, is it? Shared vision means that you've had time to deliberate, to engage with the people you work with because they may see things you don't see. I would say the worst thing a leader can do is screw up things that were working before they got there. How many of you have seen that? Because they didn't even take time to figure out what's good here. What do we need to do more of? And what do we need to do less of? How do we make sure we can communicate that vision to our community, to our staff, to the parents, so they understand? Why are we doing what we're doing? How do values figure in? Because part of building a sense of shared mission and working through differences is by leading with values. You know, one of the things that Rick and I did in the book is we agreed not to demonize each other, not to assume that he's really trying to hurt kids or destroy public education. And I know sometimes it may not seem like that when we're in heated debates, but if we can take time to listen, to exercise the ability to see another person's perspective, it can make for a very different way of uh, doing the work. I would say that leaders in times like these are really good at making friends, allies. Because if you don't have allies, then the only one you're going to hear from are the ones who don't like you. So who are your allies? Can you get other parents to come out? Can you get the union to come out? Who are the people who understand what you're trying to do and why? So that as you're making tough decisions, there are other voices that you can hear from. I think similarly, good leaders have the ability to exercise good judgment. You know, uh, my colleague Jerry Murphy, he was the dean at Harvard. He said, you know, being a school superintendent or a principal is like being a sea captain. You learn to be a sea captain at sea, not in a classroom. And hopefully you learn under somebody who was a good sea captain. Because some of what, of what you've got to learn, you're not going to learn in a book. Discretion, judgment, how to get people to work together. 
Those are qualities that are vital to good leadership. And so it's so important that as we think about these times, we also think about how to make sure that our leaders have what it's going to take to get through. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see good people who are casualties to this particular moment that we're in. And so kind, finding common ground, which as I said, ultimately is what this work is about, rest on our ability to find where we can do this work. Now, I was um, in Arizona recently. I was asked to speak to 1,000 school board members. And as many of you know, not only is Arizona very polarized, many of those people are armed, right? And I said, you know, do I really want to go down to Arizona to speak to these school board members? I said, okay, I'm, I'll do it. Because if you can't speak to people, then what's the point? And I went there and they said, well, don't talk about equity. Because equity is a dirty word. I said, well, I'm going to talk about equity and then I'm going to say what it means. All right. And so I shared this. I said, equality is treating everybody the same, even though you know they're all different. I have five kids, they're all different. Our goal is to not just make sure they're fed, in the case of a family, our joke is make sure that they are, I timed myself so I'm running out of time. <laughs> make sure that we're actually meeting their needs. And that's what equity work is about. Wes Smith, who's the chair of our DSAG board, said, his board, uh, he's also the superintendent down in Newport Beach. He said, my board doesn't like the word equity. So I said, okay, we won't talk about equity more. We'll just talk about making sure we're serving every student, because that's what we signed up to do. And that's what I reminded those board members in Arizona, every student. And I also reminded them, you know who's easiest to serve? The kids who have the most. And if the only kids we're good at serving are the kids who need the least help, then we're in trouble. That's like going to a doctor and saying, you know, and the doctor tells you, I'm only good with healthy people, okay? I'm not good with the sick people. Then you need a new doctor, right? Well, our schools have to be able to make a difference for all kinds of kids. We have to make sure we're not shortchanging kids either, that everybody's challenged. Everybody, including the kids who come to us already advanced and well prepared. And that's why ultimately equity work is about eliminating barriers. Now, why do I share this? Because when I went to Finland, the number one nation in the world in education, you know what they said their North Star is? You know what they said their priority is? They said it's equity. They said it's equity because they want to make sure that every student gets an education that prepares them for life in Finland. And that was encouraging to hear. They said, you know, we didn't even know about PISA when we came in first. We just were educating kids the way we know. And the basis of their education is child development, doing what is developmentally appropriate for kids. So I share this because being clear about what matters and what's important is what I think is going to take us, enable us to get through these times. It is hard to see good people under attack. And that's why all of us need to speak up and make sure that they're not alone. But I do believe that we will get through this. And I do believe that if we continue to do the work that matters, that we can create the schools our nation deserves. Thank you. Our dean, I think every time that um, I'm in a room with him or he's speaking, he reminds us of what good leadership is. And he uses the word impact, um, that our leadership needs to be characterized by impact that we make. So Dean Noguera, thank you um, for inspiring us and setting the tone for today. Um, we are now going to, there's, Parts to this, if you looked at the QR code, um, 
We're going to have a panel, um, first panel, and Eric Olson, who is our Executive Director of Communications at Rossier, is going to introduce the panel. Um, so that's the first part, and then you're going to have an opportunity to see an amazing short film about kids and reminding us, you know, to be grounded in what we do for young people in this nation. And then we'll have a second panel, and then we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. So, Eric, could you please come up and introduce the first panel? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Eric Olson, Director of Communications here at USC Ross here. Uh, we're excited to present two panels today, uh, mainly about the era of political polarization that we exist in, in our education system and beyond, and the steps that educators can take to overcome these challenges. We're going to hear from industry experts who provide the perspectives on what can be done at the local, state, and national levels. Today's discussions will be split into two groups with the screening of the short film A Trusted Space occurring between those two panels. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel to the stage, Dr. Vivian Etchian, retired superintendent of Glendale Unified and Stephen Nichols, founder and CEO of Nichols Strategies. as a leader in a variety of positions and particularly now as we see so many topics in our nation that have triggered a lack of trust is that we actually have to reach out to everyone regardless of whether we agree with them or not. So building trust can't happen from a distance. It really has to be built by communities uh, individual relationships, identifying the influencers in your community so that as a result of the work that you do with them, you have the opportunity to listen to those that in the past may not necessarily have been on the same page. I'll give you an example. Um, four years ago when I had the opportunity to become the superintendent in Glendale, I did not go in wanting to maintain the status quo. I was very clear about my mission. I wanted to impact my 50-foot radius. I had lived in that community for 20-some years, but I had really not engaged with the schools. So after 34 years in LA Unified, which even then I could have retired, so I've always had that option, and it has really helped me um, unleash the courage that I need to have in any situation to speak the truth about what's happening to our kids. So trust is built over time, and trust is built when you build on social capital. So identifying the leaders in your community, be it parent leaders, educator leaders, administrators, or those that don't have kids in the system, but they feel they need to weigh in, takes a lot of time and a lot of energy, but without it, it will be very difficult to accomplish anything that's good for kids. Yeah, I'd like to jump in there as well. I, I'd say that once there is a trust deficit, the repairing of that trust deficit is very, very exhausting, and it could be distracting to the organization. Um, here's here's a, a great example. Um, I'm usually called in when there's a challenge. Uh, I do communications, as you see in the QR code. Um, and when that trust um, gets to the level where they need some communications professionals to come in, um, one of the things that we realize is we have to listen and we have to understand specifically what it is that caused that trust deficit first. Because if we don't address that and we just try to go right out and come back with a communication strategy, it could fall on deaf ears. So I think that what works really well is own up to your trust deficit. I'm here with my team, uh, you know, on regular basis dealing with the, the 
how do we get out of this issue? How do we get out of it fast? Because it's distracting and it's a challenge. But really, if we slow down long enough to do the listening, understand what the trust deficit was caused by, I believe that that is the foundation of creating a good restoration plan. Now, here's the one thing I want to say. There's a book uh, called The Speed of Trust. I like the question. Um, I don't remember which covey it was, but there's a book called the, the Speed of Trust, and it takes a lot more time than we think. And so if we're prepared to be involved in that dynamic and commit ourselves to the process, over time, it will build. That's what I think. So uh, three months into my superintendency, we experienced a global pandemic. And I would say um, confrontations that had been frozen, conflicts that had been frozen, thawed. So in the community, as we had seen implicit bias, but not as explicit, as a result of the pandemic, we saw differences of opinion on everything, whether it was masking or vaccinations, of when to return to school, or how we should social distance, or what books the kids should read. I think the being away from school and not interacting with one another as directly during the pandemic really allowed people to reflect upon who they were. And sometimes they found themselves to be incredibly wonderful people who cared deeply for everyone and promoted equity, and others decided I've experienced a global pandemic and now it's going to be about what I need in my community and I will be very clear and direct about it. So nothing happens overnight. There aren't surprises. It's that how do we take polarized um, communities that are fighting over masks and bring them together and not allow every topic to become just adversarial because that is the position we have taken. So if I were to do something differently, even whether it had been about masks or anything else, uh, I would have forcefully brought those together uh, that weren't willing to be in the same room to have the conversation of common ground and what really brought us together and really tap into the 90% of individuals and parents who stayed away and said, I really don't wanna have anything to do with this. Let them fight with each other. But I really needed the 90% of the parents and community members who did not want to get involved. So my recommendation to any superintendent at this time would be focus on the 90% that does not want to get involved because we will need them to find common ground. That's a very good point. And I actually want to stay here for just a minute. Um, I think, you know, I can relate, you know, when we all emerged from kind of our COVID caves and went back into society, it felt different. People felt different. And there was so much misinformation that was allowed to foment and people just consumed all hours of every day. I'm talking to communications expert, an educational leader and a public servant, and you're actively involved uh, in grappling with that and dealing with that every day. So, you know, what can educators and communicators or people serving kind of dual roles do to combat misinformation, disinformation on social media, but also at the dawn of generative AI and deep fakes and, yeah. and, and for like that. So when you, when you said about the 95%, now that brought me to uh, some of the research uh, that came out in Pew um, about teens and social media usage. I think one of the things we have to really understand is the kind of conflicting information that is out there and that they're self-curating their information. So what, what I found was 95%, I didn't find it, Pew did, but 95% of teens between 13 and 17 years old are curators of their self-curated content. So when I was growing up, I watched what was on TV. So we talk about modeling behavior and being in a position to where you can have some good role models. Um, obviously, when the students were home and the teachers were home and the parents were pulling their hair out because they were all home at the same time in the same place, the, the ability to see role models really did go away. And it created this culture, almost this culture of, of uh, disrespect or whatever the student or anyone wanted to see. So if we understand that that many, 95% is a lot of students that are in our student age, in the secondary schools at least, they're self-curating their own content. The other thing we have to think about about the discourse is 
what is that content? Because even the stuff that's on the news, the stuff that floats to the top, is the stuff that's the, entertain the entertainment value of discourse, the entertainment value of disruption, and in community, the school boards showing up, it creates this, uh, this almost uh, reinforcement of, I guess I can act this way or this is how I'm gonna go. And so when you think about the pandemic, another thing that was happening during the pandemic, as we all know in 2020, there were protests, potentially you could call them that, but there were also a tremendous amount of assault, right? You, you saw the attack on police officers, and that's the stuff that we're, the, the conditions in which we are working in. And so communication uh, starts with understanding. We do research first in our four-step process, right, for those of us that are accredited in public relations. The research is we need to see what are, who are the different stakeholders and, that we're talking about, so parents, teachers, uh, students, the community, two thirds of them do not have kids in our schools. So what are they getting? What are they seeing? And then make our response as communications individuals and educational leaders be something that resonates. And we can learn that from what they are telling us based on what we know about our stakeholder group. Does that, you see what I'm saying there? Would you like to? I completely agree that communication is truly undervalued because we are driving the academic agenda for our students. We are focused on social emotional health for our students. But there is a portion of communication that needs to be paid attention to because if we're not doing it, someone else will take the opportunity to do so and lies will be spread and pretty soon people begin to believe because they just have access to social media. But at the same time, I would say that during this time, I was proudest of our students because the students could tell the difference between what was true and what wasn't. And the students gained their voice and no one can take that away from them. So as the adults engaged in dialogue that sometimes was helpful and other times not, the students really spoke about what mattered to them and took action and really began to take leadership roles at the school sites that they'd never had a chance before. In the midst of the pandemic and the discussions around um, equity and equality, our students at one of my high schools decided that the Performing Arts Center named after an actor who had proven himself to be someone that one should not name a performing arts center after, they wanted to change that and they took action and they were able to do it. So that school is called, that performing arts center is now the Glendale Performing Arts Center. And they took that and they did it in the best way possible. Civil discourse, doing surveys, bringing focus groups together. Our students are modeling behavior that our adults should learn from and we have to listen to them more carefully. Thank you. Um, so, can you talk to us, talk to Akshin, about relational capital? Why is that such an important tool to heal relationships that might be fractured or going through some challenges? I think uh, when we engage in listening, we actually understand and, understand and empathize with the individuals that are speaking with us. One of the greatest criticisms I had to endure from my team members was why was I spending so much time listening to every parent who wanted to come and meet with me. And yes, it was very time consuming, but in order to understand the family or where they're coming from or their ethnic background or what matters to them, you can't do shortcuts on that. You can't say I read about you and I'll skip to what do you need. And uh, I have to say in Glendale, we're a very diverse community more than uh, 50 languages spoken in our schools, but within each community group, it's not monolithic. So if people have the assumption that if you are this, or if you're that, you all believe the same, you all say the same, and you're all coming from that same heart and mind and belief system, you're really building a pathway to um, a disaster because we're not, we're compartmentalizing people by their ethnicity or by their social emotional uh, description of what they feel, 
while we're not really respectful of what the end in mind is. I think strategies can vary, but our outcomes can't. If our outcome is student success, their well-being and their ability to function as individuals, no matter who they are, in schools, then we prioritize that and we go on top of mountains and scream that and that's the non-negotiable. Every child in our school system deserves to be there and to be protected. And none of this can happen alone. A huge burden on the entire system. On my school board, I have my uh, board president in the audience. Um, it takes a toll on them and their families too because not everyone likes that and not everyone agrees to it. But we made a commitment together that what was best for our students mattered to us and everything else would have to be important but not as important as what we could do for our kids. Would you, would you like to yeah, I do. I, I want to say uh, relational capital, I think it's a very good way to put it. Um, I, my uh, mentor and friend, Tom DeLapp, is also in the audience. I'm going to borrow something from him. It's public relationships is what PR really stands for. We're doing public relationships, and that relational capital starts internal and external. So one of the strategies that I used to use is I would build relationships with the inner agencies, the people that we do business with, the police departments. We would act before you see smoke. We've all heard that before. So when you have that situation and the school board is calling and they're like, ah, what's going on? You've already got some relationships in there. So when, when, the, when you need to... Relationships are better than networks. I say that all the time. You build those relationships over time. And when sometimes an owie happens in your community, it could be self-induced, or it could be uh, an insurgent situation or external pressures and so forth. You can let, rely on those relationships. And you call, like Game of Thrones reference, you call in the banners. You know, you call those folks in. They can help you through the things because sometimes when you're inside the system, all you really can do is respond. You know, so you need those people that are trusted, that you've built trust with over time, that can be a sounding board for you and can help you as the leader of the school system help your leadership, which is your board, and don't forget the other stakeholder groups. You know, you've got students we've talked about, but sandwiched in the middle between administrators and students, and parents, of course, are the teachers and the, the biggest workforce. And when you don't have relationships with them, that can go really, really hairy really quickly because what they're going to do is they'll be at the supermarket and somebody's going to see them as a trusted leader because they're inside your system. And then they're telling the narrative uh, that they want to tell. And you don't have that relationship. So, I mean, it can could, it could, uh, metastasize very quickly if we don't have that relational capital. But that takes some time to build and maintain it. And very, very quickly it can drop. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so trust intersects you know, here with the culture of safety and well-being at the classroom level. Um, there's so much rhetoric, conversation, debate that goes on at a very macro level uh, in school districts and every facet of society right now. How in this context of education can we bring public debate and discourse back to the classroom level and teach the importance of, you know, cultivating a loving and caring environment for learning and teaching? That's definitely you. <laughs> um, I think working with our employees, working with the parents who are willing to be the role models is really important. Um, going back to the relational capital piece, what is it that we want at the end of the day? Do we want to prepare students to be college career and life ready and community mm -hmm. ready? We don't live in a fortress. We have to have skills and competencies that can cascade into the community and our students have to be able to engage in that conversation. Many of our teachers are willing to do that and are very good at it. Priority is around history, social science teachers or English teachers. They consider this to be more of a subject that they're comfortable doing, but I think it needs to be really um, training and professional development for all of our teachers because the questions pop up in every course in every subject area. It's not necessarily just in those where you think debate or differences of opinion uh, come up and are valued. I think it's hard when it's uh, conversations around hearts, minds, and belief systems. I was um, very comfortable asking for resources 
beyond ESSER funds, beyond FEMA funds, we were able to gain $23 million in resources for our kids above and beyond what the district would generate on a regular period of time. That was easy because the why was there. We need wellness rooms. Why? Because our kids came out of the pandemic and needed a place to go where they felt comfortable and they received the support they needed without it being a stigma attached to it. When it came to hearts and minds and discrimination and topics around equity, 48% of our students were living in poverty. Who was advocating for them? Who was advocating for the English learners who didn't have access to electives? How are we going to be able to transform a system to have block schedule and a seven period day without getting some people upset? So the conversation can take a long time, but we can't always assume that everyone will want to be part of that effort because it's best for our kids, particularly the kids who don't have a voice or the parents who do not know how to advocate for their kids. So at the same time, when we are called disruptors or whatever the name is, we've been called worse. If uh, your eye is on the ball and you say what you do is because it will help certain populations that in the past have been under-resourced and marginalized, you can go home every day and say, I'm continuing to focus on what matters. And if it, that's not your mission as a superintendent, then you're not probably um, in the right job. And I feel every day with the teams that I work with and the parents who were supportive, uh, it mattered to us at the end of the day to have made a difference for a student population that did not have a chance to succeed without pushing, without, as um, our dean said, without really bringing to everyone's attention the equity gaps that existed in our community. And we should not be uh, proud of gaps in our own community because we're the only ones to blame for it. It's nobody else's fault. It's our mission to close those gaps. So there's a lot of lofty, like, big conversations and challenges that we face right now. But I think ultimately, you know, we do this work, everyone in this room does this work because it's mission oriented and that's rooted in hope. So I just want to ask you both, what gives you hope right now? Where do you derive your hope from? You know, I, I was, we're 50 years, starting next year, next year, I believe, from Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, the conversations about desegregation in schools are still very, very poignant. One of the work I did in New York City uh, is with the Magnet School Assistance Program and realizing the fascinating, uh, the, the, the need for a program that still require desegregation where they bring me in to help work on enrollment strategies to try to bring people in to create more of a diverse en environment. I, I'm, I'm hopeful because we're a long way from Brown. The world looks a lot different than it did 50 years ago. You know, so what gives me hope is that we're not in a situation where it's mandated segregation. So that gives me hope. We're in a situation where if we build it, they could come, but how do you make it to where it's palatable? Because a good marketer understands that you don't just build things and then go sell the widget. You understand what is the demand and then you develop and deploy that to satiate the need. So I'm hopeful about the fact that the conditions are not what they always were, but I'm also understanding that the polarization that we talked about earlier is causing a self-segregation situation where people are picking their kids up, going to where they wanna go. So uh, I, I think that the hope is that we're in a better position politically, uh, at least legally, but we still have some work to do and I'm fired up about the fact that I get to help educators all over the country communicate the work that they're doing uh, in such a way that it brings people back to the schools in a way that's engaging and valuable for all the three different stakeholders that we talked about. How about you? Um, I have hope in our students. I think student voice and student choice matters. I think our students know what they need and are expressing it. And we have to redirect resources to make that happen for them. And we have to allow them to drive their own understanding of what the work will look like in the future. I think partnerships, um, whether it's with a community college, dual enrollment, 
uh, K-12 education cannot be isolated. It's really looking at the education as a different um, pathway and not allowing ourselves to only live and maintain what we have. And I think we are sitting in a state where our political individuals have really signed legislation to support kids and protect kids, and that doesn't happen in every state. And I think it's really important for us to value the opportunity to protect all kids and talk about it. Yeah. Thank you both so much. We could have this conversation for hours. I'm sure we're unfortunately out of time, but I just wanted to thank you both for your service and for, for joining us today and for lending your perspectives to, to all of us. Thank, thank you. you. Dean, thank you for having us. session today, our dean, um, always reminding us of impact, reminded us that this is all about making an impact for the young people of our communities and our nation. And so we have um, a reminder now about young people and the state that they are in. And we are going to see a very short film uh, that is kind of a, there's a longer version of it. It's called A Trusted Space, and Lori Woodley Langendorf, the director, um, producer, is in the audience, and I'm hoping that some of you will have an opportunity to talk to her during the reception, if she would just stand so I could acknowledge her. Lori. So this connects, um, as the dean reminded us, it all has to be toward the service of young people, of our students and children. So we're going to see a um, short film and bring it up. So right now the education ecosystem is, um, it's a hot mess. Can I say it's a hot mess? People keep saying, oh, we're getting back to normal, we're getting closer to normal. But I think we really need a new definition of what normal is. Um, I think there's a really slow recovery process that we're in right now. And unfortunately, because we don't have the masks and some of like the visual reminders, uh, I think there's almost an assumption that we're further along in our recovery than we really are. There's just a lot of things right now with our students and helping them figure out how to navigate school, how to navigate friendships, even just being in a classroom with a teacher. There's nothing that's happening right now that's new. This ask for teachers to do more than what they've been hired and trained to do, that's not new, but now we're doubling down on it. The mental health crisis in our children and youth that existed before the pandemic, and now it's been exacerbated. And before, you know, it was always this, well, this is that pocket of kids, right? This is the poor side of town, et cetera. This is these, and we certainly have that. We have those that have and those that have not. But the pandemic made it worse for everybody, right? And I think everybody understands that now, that teachers professionally really do make a difference. We're either, we are the caretakers of the culture that pass it forward. Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. 
We are on the other side of a pandemic and there was so much hope that we would capture the moment and reinvent, innovate, make some of the things that weren't working for all kids better in education. And people are worried that we didn't do that. You know, we see, for example, right now, enrollment in school has gone down. And it's not simply because uh, of demographics, but it's also that many parents are choosing to educate their kids at home, avoid schools they think are unsafe. Um, and, and that is an indicator that something is wrong. We haven't recovered. It's alarming, actually. <laughs> it's really alarming to hear how many students do not come to school the amount of absences. I mean, these are, these are by definition, truant students, um, but they're not, you know, incapable of doing their work. They, they just socially, emotionally, mentally can't get themselves to a place to come physically to school. The kids are not doing great. Um, the kids need a lot of support and a lot of love right now. Coming out of COVID, I'm seeing a lot more anxiety, depression. Um, a lot of people are experiencing a lot of like overwhelm and like overstimulation. I've had a lot of violent outbursts in my classroom uh, this school year. I had a fight break out in my classroom. I've had students throw things at each other, at me. Technology, whether that's phones or video games or just watching content, there's more and more time separated from their peers, separated from their families. And what we've noticed is that uh, young people are having a harder and harder time learning how to come together across their differences, navigating big emotions when things go wrong. There's really this distinct shift in how students are being able to cope with just life. I think a lot of them experience a lot of trauma, so that they feel like they, whenever they do feel pain or they're hurt, they don't know how to process that emotion. So I think that's one big challenge. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that there were thousands of kids who lost a parent, a grandparent, a caregiver uh, to COVID um, as a result of the pandemic. And I think that's not seen because it disproportionately affects the poorest people. Um, on top of that now, we've had dozens of mass shootings. There's that piece and there's the social emotional learning too, that there's so many things. If a student is not going home and eating right and sleeping and doing all these things and, and getting the care that they need, how can we expect them to be in the classroom and open their minds to learning? I know our teachers work on that daily. I think what makes it hard is there's a lot being asked of us right now and we can't do it all. You know, every year we get more and more things that we're required to teach, but with less resources. And this job is becoming impossible on paper because of that. And that's why I really believe that we're losing so many good people, because they can get jobs with more pay that are easier. Schools need to be resourced appropriately. Um, we're not. Teachers need to be paid a living wage. It's not supposed to be easy work, right? Nobody's asking it to be easy work, um, but don't put uh, barriers in front of all of these people that don't need to exist. As we're having this conversation, the question of how comes up. How do we do this? What do we do? Everything feels daunting. Everything feels overwhelming. How? We help teachers to be able to create trusted spaces within their classrooms. We help administrators to be able to create trusted spaces for their staff in order that we are creating these um, entities of healing where people can show up being their authentic selves and kind of working through these really hard situations that we're all in. What we really need is to let kids move themselves through these spaces. And they do that when they feel safe, when it's expected, when it's modeled by the teachers, and when the content that's around them warrants it. It's not just about get your work done, it's about 
think about this work and now try to do something with it, but then notice something, right? And as you move yourself in and out of that space, you're building your mind and your brain. You're building your regulatory capacity. You're building your ability to adapt yourself to a communal space where people are thinking together. Being visible, um, that's where the connection comes in. It's not from an office or an ivory tower where you're gonna write a slip so I wanted to talk to you. Right now, I'm out in the open. I'm here in this yard. It's not just to stand here as another, you know, another object, but something where I could bounce an idea off a student, maybe get their perspective on something, maybe ask them how they're doing. I think teens are, are smarter and wiser and have more wisdom than we give them credit for. Uh, I think they often know the answers to their own questions inside of themselves. And so I think that's something that I found a lot of success with in working in, with students is like, what would you tell me if I was in this position? If I was in your shoes right now, what would you say? What would you try to do to make me feel better? We need to not be afraid of what our students tell us. We need to be empowered by it. We need to ask them, even if what we hear is a little bit of an ouch, we need to hear them. And that doesn't mean they always have to get their way, but when they feel heard and responded to, seen, that's when we're gonna have them as allies. The best leaders are the humblest servants. And when teachers come into the classroom Making it extremely known that they're paid to be here and that's it is like, okay, I get it, you're paid to be here. Maybe you're underpaid, but you still have a class and I still have to graduate. So can we just be kind? I have specific teachers that don't welcome us to class. How was your weekend? Like little messages like that go a long way. Oftentimes I speak with other students and we all have the same question and it's like we're not getting our questions answered by the teacher. So I know a lot of students will kind of suffer in silence trying to understand a concept or topic, and I've personally done this myself. And to be honest, when students ask you questions, being condescending is like, okay, I will never ask you another question again. I think I mostly see just the teacher because they don't really like tell us stories about them. We just know that they're there to teach us and stuff like that. But there are some, a few teachers that I know what happens like at home and how, what they're going through. And those are the teachers usually that help me and have conversations with me to know what I'm going through at home. I think, I think those are better teachers. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So the question is, how are you gonna show them? How are you gonna create that safe environment how you're gonna deal with them when they come at you. And, re and remember that it's not personal. Some teachers though just aren't touchy-feely in that kind of way and we need to respect that as well. But at the same time, we've also gotta figure out how can we still build in that relationship piece? Because if you don't have the relationship piece, you don't have discipline in your classroom. So what do you do to get them to care as much as you do about what you teach? It's building relationships. Make it matter. How do you do that? Is be real with them. So both common sense and a century of developmental science and the neuroscience all squarely point to the fact that to think about ideas that transcend the here and now, to think about the big ideas, the deep understanding, the why, the how, and not just the what, requires kind of letting go of your outward vigilance to maintain safety, to notice things in the environment. And so what students need and what teachers need too is a safe communal space where this is normalized, where this is, is valued. I know that students really seek that time to connect with each other as human beings. So that sounds really warm fuzzy and you know, in some ways it is, but um, they, it, it's like the air they breathe, they, they need it. I teach because, sincerely, I think that every day provides an opportunity for me to build a lifelong relationship with somebody. I think it's part of my job to do that, and I think every day provides an opportunity for me to reach a kid, uh, and I think that I'm the luckiest person in the world. I think I have the best job in the world. 
I don't see myself doing anything else. When the classroom door closes, the teacher has a lot of power for creating that environment. And so my message to teachers is use that power. Use the power you have to build that community because um, it does pay off and you can create an environment that is supportive for your students without asking permission to do so. It's on the horizon. I think it's something that we're gonna talk about a lot in the years to come. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna come here before we know it for kids to have the human experience in school. And I think we need to start rethinking how we teach, what we teach, and why we teach. Our kids deserve us to do the hard thing. Let's not look at it like what's not possible. We gotta look at it at what is possible to lean into it and have fun with change. If we in the education system meet this moment well, with courage and optimism, with innovation, with learning for ourselves and shifting our mindsets is how we move forward and heal in the most beautiful ways. Lori, again, thank you uh, for your work. You will all, uh, you'll get a follow-up uh, email and you'll get the entire film. Uh, there'll be a link, so watch for that. But that centered us on why we're here and having this discussion about change um, that is so radical and really finding common ground because it's about our students, this next generation. So Eric and I invite you back so that we can get the next panel up. All right, thank you. Our next panel is going to be comprised of Dr. Pedro Nogueira, the Dean of USC Ross here, and Leslie Brunton, the Executive Vice President of Nichols Strategies. Come up. All right, so in this era we live in, you know, kids get caught in the crosshairs a lot, as you saw in that. Students are really struggling with their mental health, burnout, all these things that you know, us as adults struggle with as well. So I just want to start by asking, you know, how do we overcome all the negatives and focus on the opportunities this current environment provides for leadership? Let me start with you. I think we have to listen to what our young people are telling us. In the past month, in my community, the very school system where I served for 12 years. Over the course of one weekend, our community saw a fatal accident where two young people lost their lives, and they saw a young man who died as a result of um, suicide. That's what students in my community had to deal with. Two different schools over the course of a single week. And administrators, my former coworkers, had to figure out how to come together to support these young people in this moment. For me, as a mom of an 11th grader who knew one of the students who passed away, and as a communicator, it really gave me an opportunity to take stock and think about what we're doing um, as a profession to support families in the middle of crisis. So for those of you who are administrators, maybe you have some sort of handbook that you go to. Go to page 13 if there's a car wreck. Go to page 17 if there's a fire. But those handbooks aren't enough. They really aren't. What information can we provide to families to help them meet that moment? Which was exactly the message of, of the um, documentary we just saw a second ago. And so I spent time thinking about what did I need as a parent of 11th grader that was going through this crisis and watching her friends hurt? What resources could the school provide? And so I was able to pick up the phone and call the lady who um, was my successor and say, it's not enough just to acknowledge that this terrible thing has happened. Can you provide some resources to families? As that is a key part of communication as well. Help parents find the words to have the conversation. Our children are in crisis. They are going through a lot, and some of them are suffering in silence 
with only the blue light of a cell phone reflected towards their face. We've got to be able to provide parents with the resources to be able to help their children. And as educators, whether it's social workers or counselors or just folks that have studied child development, this is not something that I as a parent have learned. I didn't go to school for that. And so for me as a parent, I'm leaning on you guys, the folks in this room, to be able to help our students get through moments like this. So I would say that we need to make sure that we're listening to the young people in our lives, that we're actually hearing what they need, and offering solutions. We may not have all the answers, but being a listening ear and offering solutions to families to help their children through this moment is critically important. You know, I just want to echo what Leslie said about listening to students. Um, you know, imagine one of these school board meetings, like the ones Vivian's been through, <laughs> where it's, you got these adults heated, um, raging, um, because they're always bringing a lot of rage. But imagine if you bring a group of students to talk about the work they do at their school, the science projects, the whatever it is, most adults behave better Absolutely. <laughs> in the presence of children. Now, that's not always true, but I would say for the vast majority, when children are around, it tends to result in them calming down and remembering. And, and so student voice, <clears throat> as you just said, is a resource we don't tap nearly enough. You know, kids will tell you where they feel safe. Kids will tell you what they need. Kids will tell you, you know, where they're learning and where they're not. I always say it takes courage to listen to kids because once you listen, you have a responsibility to do something about it. And uh, so I, I, I really agree with that. And, and that's what, you know, Laurie, thank you again for the film, is a reminder of why we do this work. You know, that, you know, the test scores are out, but if the kids are stressed out and depressed, guess what? It's going to be hard to raise those scores if you don't address those issues. So um, listening to the students and then creating that space where they feel supported, safe, trusted is so critical to addressing their needs and making sure they can, in fact, learn. Thank you both. So you both just talked about listening and the importance of being an active listener. What are some of the traits, you know, if that doesn't come natural to someone, what can they do to improve their active listening skills? Like what are the, the common traits for effective active listeners in this arena? Mm. Good. Two ears and one mouth. It's a lesson that we learned very early on. So the fact that we have two ears, you need to listen more than you speak. We should um, listen to understand the other person's position and why they're there. Some of our leadership tendencies have not always precluded themselves to be involved in active listening. We have, some of us have experienced working places where maybe the superintendent or the principal wasn't really concerned with coalition building. There was a time when that wasn't necessarily the skill that was, um, it wasn't the top of mind skill. And I'm thinking of the article that was published last month in AASA in their blog about the new realities of landing a superintendent. They gave five, but the first one talked about communicator in chief. That is so critical, especially after what we've all experienced as a result of the pandemic. You know, we've had tons of people swarm our board meetings, people who are not used to the ebb and flow of a board meeting, how it behaves, what's supposed to be said, when do you say it, when can you stand up? Um, and introducing them to that nomenclature and the behavior of those things is so important. But even then, that requires those folks to listen. And they're not gonna listen if they don't feel listened to. So how do we meet them with respect? And I shared this with um, the panel earlier as we were talking about this. Schools haven't traditionally been set up in a way that we're listening and this nature of active listening and this culture of respect. Because we've got this hierarchical system, we don't challenge the teacher, we don't talk back to the superintendent, you know, we're a good soldier. 
and we do what the superintendent says. The interesting thing about the pandemic is that it emboldened folks in our communities to redress government. I'm a former television reporter. I've been covering board meetings and going to board meetings for over 20 years. I actually kind of like it. <laughs> I find it interesting, the interplay between um, a governing body and the community. So when we think about that kind of interaction, if the folks showing up to the microphone for the first time and are redressing their government and they don't get met with respect, what do you think is going to happen? And so it really requires us to step back within ourselves, to understand their perspective, and to know that anybody who's going to give up a Monday night, a Tuesday night, or any other night that we're meeting really cares about that issue. And I would like to think, in the effort to search for common ground, that we're there because we care about kids. And so this idea of demonization and vilification doesn't work if we're trying to find solutions for kids. So, you know, let me go back to the book um, that we did, Rick Hess and I. Um, it was his idea. He was the one who suggested, let's do a book together where we have this exchange of ideas through letters. And uh, although I was busy with other things, I immediately said yes. And the reason why I said yes is because we live in a society where we're most accustomed to talking to people who agree with us already. If you only talk to people that you agree with, if you only listen to the news that you want to hear, <laughs> you end up in an echo chamber. And you don't even understand why someone might think differently. And what was interesting about this exercise is that Rick would provoke me right, with something he initiated. And I, so I would drop what I was doing. But because we were doing it in, by writing, not on stage, I had time to think about what he had said and how I was going to respond. So that, what was interesting is so we did the book, and then we did podcast. And then we got invited around the country to speak. And people were curious because people had not seen that in so long. People who disagree engaged in civil discourse, where we actually listen to each other and respectfully respond. And uh, you know, over and over again, what I, I find interesting is that there is an audience out there in America in red and blue states uh, for people who want that, who want to see that, who are tired of the yelling. And uh, I just hope that we can figure out how to bring that, especially to education, because you know, the issues, there are kids' lives and futures at stake. And so if we can't figure out how to talk through some of these issues um, and approach them with a sense of reasonableness, uh, we're in trouble. So um, I'm hoping that many of you are inspired to take this on where you live and to do this important work. Because if the loudest voices in the room suck up all the air, we're in trouble. So we talk about the need for finding common ground. A lot of that starts with a conversation. It starts with active listening. And you know, how do we ultimately convert that discourse into action? You know, the conversation about building a conversation around trust and safety, it's happening, it's very important. How do we convert that into a series of sustained, successful actions that you know, we can't just apply to one school, but we can systematize and make it national? Where does that kind of action start? I don't know. I, you know I, I think a lot of it is how do we create the space for dialogue, right? Um, it doesn't just happen. It has to be intentional. It has to be um, something that we build in. Um, we have to, you know, at the university level, we have to teach it, right? <laughs> we have to, you know, I, I, I challenged the faculty. I said, do our students only hear one perspective? Because if they're only getting one perspective, what happens when they leave us and go out into the world and they're encountering people who disagree? And they're not even clear on why they think what they think because they've never encountered ideas that are contrary. Um, but I think it's not just at the university. 
um, we have to go beyond that. And, and school board meetings, you know, I served on the school board. Most of the time, no one's there. Most right? of the time. And, and you're happy for that because they can get home early, right? But when they're there, then there's theatrics. And uh, you have to figure out, okay, how do we not allow the theatrics to distract us from what is at hand, what the priorities are? And so I think leading with values, you know, the, your budget is a reflection of your values. Um, how you deal with negotiations mm -hmm. is, again, a reflection of values. So articulating those values and making it clear that our decisions are made with the best interest of our community, our students, um, is, I think, a reminder. It doesn't mean everything's always going to work out, but hopefully, um, again, people of goodwill will see those good intentions. I think, as the dean um, pointed out earlier, the idea of the North Star. He just said a second ago that a budget is a reflection of values. There are other values that your district has, whether it's your mission statement, your values, your strategic plan. Do those entities, do those things, those statements have an idea of respect in them? Do they have the concept of communication in them? Do they have the idea of engagement in them? So if you don't write it down, you certainly aren't going to do it. I mean, we can wish for it all that we want, but in those school systems where you see those value statements, whether they're mission, vision, beliefs, budget, and we have someone, a leader who's willing to hearken the team back and remind them, this is what we say we believe in. We're putting money towards STEM. We're putting money towards SEL. We believe in a culture of mutual respect. We believe in two-way engagement. So it's not just enough to put a line item in the budget. It's not just enough to put it in your mission statement or your belief statement. Those two things have to match up. So if I see it in your mission statement, your beliefs, your strategic plan, I really hope there's a line item in your budget that supports having two-way engagement, having effective communication. I really hope that if you have a communications practitioner, you give them a budget that they can control to help support this idea of two-way engagement. I really hope that if you say that two-way engagement is important, as um, Superintendent Ekian talked about, we're not gonna just read a survey, we're gonna talk to some people, we're gonna hold some focus groups. So that's a value that we have, that we're gonna ask people what they think, we're gonna receive that information and do something with it. So it's, it's making sure that you are not only talking the talk, but you're walking the walk. They line up, they really do. So I'm talking to two effective communicators, so I think I'd be remiss. You know, we have uh, school districts from around the region here today. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, what are the most important communications tools, like specific tools or methods, programs that schools and school districts should consider implementing? that uh, they may not have already? I would say your brand promise. What are you promising your community that you're going to do for your kids? And we say that, we demonstrate that in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's with some boilerplate statement that we've got, we've called in a consultant, they've brought out their chart paper and the markers and we've wordsmithed it to death. But is that actually what your students experience? If I look at your website, if I look at the materials that you're putting out, are your words reflected there? Are you living your mission? So I'll give you a brief example. I have a child who's a foodie. He doesn't like fancy food, but he likes for food to be good. He likes for it to be well seasoned, the temperature to be right, all of the things. So I get to town last night and he sends his dad and me a picture of a new menu item that the school system is rolling out. And I said, where did you find this? He's like, I went to the menus page. A beautiful picture of something called tachos. Nachos built on tater tots with all the toppings. And we had this conversation about how good this meal was going to be and how good he thought it was going to be. Because the picture was gorgeous. I mean, it, there were cherry tomatoes, there were black beans, there were corn, all of the things. It had all, you know, the five senses right there. And so his dad said, send us a picture of your lunch. I got a picture, and it was not as advertised. 
at all. And so for him, the promise of what his school offered was not what was delivered on his plate. And for our parents, that happens too often. And when that does happen, and that is your experience, you've lost trust. If that keeps happening time and time again, the compounded deficit of trust, what does that mean? So if I look at your district and you tell me that you're suffering a declining enrollment, and we look at the per pupil allocation of that, and over time, you know, for some districts, I was looking at one district, how many kids would it take for, say, New York City public schools to lose a million dollars? I think the number I looked at was about 41 kids. So every 41 kids they lost based off the numbers I was seeing that that was what it was gonna, the impact. So those deficits of trust do matter. And delivering on your brand promise does matter. So the idea that you have a website, that you put out collateral, if the children on your website don't look like engaged lifelong learners, are you really delivering on that, that promise? And if you ask the students, again to your point, for a student voice, is the district delivering on what it promised? Because I know a 12 year old who felt like he was promised something pretty delicious. And now he has an opinion about his experience. And so that opinion now becomes his reality and he tells his friends. And so we've got to work hard to counter those messages that those brand ambassadors are giving against what we say we're going to deliver on, half of ki on behalf of kids in our district. I, I really like your response because it's not just the ability to communicate ideas, you have to match them up by delivery, right? Exactly. Because if there's a gap, then people see through it. And uh, <clears throat> I think there's often been um, too much of a gap between what is said and what is experienced when it comes to education. You know, I often say, how often do students come home at the end of the day and say, wow, what a day. That was inspiring. I'm still waiting. <laughs> I'm still waiting. You know, it should happen sometimes, yeah. though. Right? It should happen that sometimes kids come home and say, that was really good. Can't wait to go back. And um, it, 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 when I put it like that, it reminds people, what is the goal of education? The goal of education, if you want kids to become lifelong learners, they have to be challenged, they have to be stimulated, they have to feel supported, they have to feel like what they're learning matters, is meaningful, is relevant, and when that happens, they want more. Mm -hmm. They want more. And uh, I've gone to schools where I see that, um, and so, so I know this is not just a pipe dream, that it does in fact happen. Um, but I, I, the, the, this connection between what, how we describe what we're doing, which is so critical that if leaders who can't explain what they're doing are always in trouble, but it has to be backed up by real actions. Uh, it has to show up in the experiences of our students. So I think it's all got to come together. Otherwise, it's just words, and uh, people see right through that. I do. So we talked today about you know, the theme of a North Star, and kind of like you look to your North Star for inspiration and for guidance. And I think for so many of us, at least the way it's supposed to be, you're supposed to look to a few thousand miles away from here, you know, the halls of Congress, you see the people that run this country for hope and inspiration and guidance. I think the citadel of democracy right now is kind of struggling to keep the lights on at present. And there hasn't been a lot of positive discourse for a long time. That impacts what happens in the classroom, in every classroom around the country. I have my friends that are high school teachers. Every time something happens, it impacts their classroom the next day. So can we talk a little bit more about you know, how those occurrences impact classroom dynamics and what, what can teachers do? Because it's so politically sensitive. If they correct for it one way, you might upset another group of parents or students. So what do you do to manage the, that element of polarization and that unpredictability of it as as an educator right now? You know, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning of my talk. Leadership, we can't just look to the individuals who hold elected office, the individuals who are in the role of leader. Leadership has to show up in lots of different sectors, right? Um, we have to all, at different times, lead. Mm -hmm. And by lead, it means not just sit back and watch as things get worse. Um, <laughs> a, a funny story, I was uh, 
at, at going to the supermarket, and there's, near the supermarket I go to, there's a Kuman. And the Kuman was letting out, and there were lots of families and parents, and really busy parking lot, and there's a bump, two cars hit each other. And the men get out, and they're like ready to fight in the parking lot. And it's like a mess, and everybody's just watching. So I say to the, I see a, a postal worker. I said, officer, you need to stop this. She said, I'm not an officer. I said, you're the best we've got. You need to tell these men they should not be fighting in front of these, these people. And the men stopped, and they realized they were acting like idiots, yeah. and they stopped. <laughs> but, you know, and that's just an example that sometimes you, you if it's when we don't speak up, when we don't take action, mm -hmm. it, it, it allows the chaos the, to just continue. And um, so when I think of leadership, I'm not just thinking of the people who have the title. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the parents. I'm thinking of the, the, those in our community who need to stand up and say, look, this is not the way we should do things. You know, this is not the way we should behave in front of our children. And I think if we had more of that, our democracy would be in a lot better shape than it is right now. I come from a long line of educators. My mom, dad, grandmother, great-grandmother, cousin, aunt, step-grandmother were all teachers. So this, my earliest memories are being in a school. And I think about how educators were viewed when I was growing up. Very, the, the wisdom that teachers gave. Something happened during the pandemic where people increased their capacity for internet speed during the pandemic that allowed them to access information faster, made them think that they were smarter than some folks who've been studying this stuff and do it as their life's work. Um, as I watched the documentary there, I was really struck by something. The people who were featured have personal, relevant voice. Add that voice to the conversation. But where is that voice not? So when I think about it as a communicator, we talk about having a chair at the table. We got some tables in this country that we didn't even invite the folks with the voice to. Conversations that were happening in the documentary around in um, faculty rooms, in meetings after school, between colleagues in the hallway, those conversations aren't happening in the halls of Congress. We've got people with very fast dial-up speeds on their internet that have accessed information from somewhere, I don't know where, um, that are creating pieces of legislation, creating schools of thought to um, cover over the challenges that you guys are seeing. We heard from students that are telling what it's like to feel like when your teacher doesn't care or shows up and says that you're really just a paycheck and I'm just waiting to time to clock out. But we're not willing to listen to the voice of students and teachers and use those voices to reflect how legislation is implemented and policy changes at the national level. So for me, when I think about um, how all of this comes together, I really would hope that there are opportunities in the discourse that we're listening to people that do this as their life's work, who studied this intimately, that have fr firsthand experiences, not something they saw on a blog or wherever they found it, but the experts the way that it was viewed when I was a little girl, if the teacher spoke and talked about what they're seeing in the classroom, it held weight. And that's where I wish that um, we could return to. I think that would be much more effective than some of the stuff that we're seeing now. Thank you both so much for your time. Um, at this time, I want to invite our previous panelists onto the stage and open up uh, the floor to Q&A from the audience. And uh, if you do have a question, as our panelists convene here, uh, we have a microphone right over there and then right over here. Um, you can just line up and ask your questions. Don't all get up at once. <laughs> Thank 
because we were brilliant. <laughs> nothing left to be said, right? the world's questions. <laughs> uh, while we wait for people to kind of gather their thoughts, I do want to just ask you know, what, I, what I concluded the first panel with. I want to ask both of you, uh, what gives you hope right now um, as we navigate these, these challenging times? Hmm. Uh, I think I'll borrow from Vivian. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the kids. It's, you know, when I speak to young people, um, I, they are aware of, how difficult the time is uh, we're in. But they are more hopeful uh, uh, about their own futures. Um, I think they're losing a lot of faith in adults, though. And, and that's troubling, right? Um, because um, you, would, you would think that they would believe that their parents, their teachers, the adults are going to help guide them through this. Um, and I think that many of them are starting to feel like they're going to have to be the ones. Um, but I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact, I was, I was talking to uh, the chancellor of UC Merced, um, uh, which is the only sustainable carbon neutral R1 campus in the country right now. Right? And it's, a, it's the newest of the UCs. And he's from LA, grew up in East LA. And I said, what's it like being a chancellor? He says, I love it. He said, my kids, my students are awesome. And he was just telling me about the energy, the vision, the imagination, and the hope they bring, and how it inspires him to do the work. And, and I think the closer you are to those students, the more you're reminded that they really are our future. I would agree with that with the young people. This summer, my daughter and I got a chance to attend the National um, Summer Youth Leadership Academy. And I was there in Washington, D.C. for a week on a college campus with about 30 young people from across the nation. Putting these young people in the room um, and watching their creativity, their collaboration, um, building connections. And so that was, it really broadened the horizon of a child that I'm raising who has a very blessed life to see how people from a different part of the country live their lives, for them to talk about what was happening in their classrooms, to talk about what was happening in their high schools. Um, technology can be a wonderful thing and harnessed. We left and immediately went to the National School Public Relations Association conference, so she didn't get to say proper goodbyes. By the time we had landed, her, what, her, um, I think they were on Instagram, she had missed well over 200 messages flying from DC to St. Louis. They were all talking about how the weather impacted their ability to get home. And so those are young people who are still connected. Uh, they share about their lives. They are talking about, you know, next summer visiting one another just from that one experience. So as we, as the adults, are sitting in rooms where young people are, if we just watch and see how they're interacting, give them a chance to be empowered to lead the way, we might really be surprised at, at some of the solutions that they come up with to solve some of the challenges we're facing. I'd like to jump into the conversation because today is also about sharing practices. And student voice panels in Glendale really worked for us. Many of the policies that the board adopted and we were able to implement were as a result of student voice panels and students speaking about what they needed and how they saw the world and what had to change on their campuses and across the district. So I strongly encourage school districts to have student voice panels and allow the students to really comment on what matters. They formulate their own questions they debate one another as to what matters, and they come up with solutions. And then it's up to the superintendent and the principal and the cabinet to come up with the resources. And the parents are good listeners as well when they see their own kids come up with these ideas and speak to what matters to them. And it started from pretty simple things like, we don't want vaping in the bathroom because some of us don't like to go there then, which is like, absolutely true and there were kids who came up with apps so you could do anonymous reporting so that there was an opportunity because we can't have someone guarding every bathroom to go into um, training and education around vaping and how that was impacting our entire community very negatively and 
in a community where there are a lot of smoke shops and there are a lot of, there's a lot of business, it was again a courageous step on behalf of our students to be able to speak to that. But it didn't stop there. They spoke about how kids treated one another and whether there were opportunities for additional learning around bullying, opportunities for interactions of teachers and students. What we heard um, as what we watched, we heard that many, many times, that all they wanted is for the person teaching to say, I care about you and I want to learn more about what makes you want to be in my classroom and how can we build that relationship so that I feel heard and seen. So a student voice panel certainly and also when we needed a lot of help in tu uh, tutoring, our kids, the ones who were receiving A's and went to a training to learn how to become a tutor, became our best labor partner because we paid them uh, $14 an hour to be able to teach their um, peers and the under the supervision of the teachers. So they were able to gain funding that they redirected to their interests in places where they actually were able to uh, promote learning and teaching and the next workforce possibly. But kids like to learn from other kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is a way in which they are able to explain concepts that are understood and uh, connect, connect and relationships and honor one another for what matters at school, which is academic achievement uh, coupled with the wellness that we all hope to see in our future adults. I think we do have an audience question. Thank you. Yes, hello, thank you, Dean. You always walk the talk. My question is for uh, Mrs. Brewington. You talked about the compounded deficit of trust, and you link that to a school district's or school set ecosystem's brand promise. Can you talk a little bit more about what elements should be part of that brand promise that will limit the deficit of trust? I love that question. Thank you for asking it. You know, when I look at how do you counter the deficit of trust, let's take stock of what's in your mission statement, what's in your core beliefs, what's in your value statement. I'd also point you to looking at your strategic plan. Those things should really serve as your North Star. So if you're building a communications um, response or plan around those things, what I would expect to see in your communications plan would be the personification of that brand, that value statement. Show me how you are living the mission. So if you say that we are um, wanting to have people who are global citizens, what does that mean? Is it just because you have an international day or is it more of a well-rounded program? Is it embedded in the culture of the school through an international baccalaureate program? If you say that we support students' social, emotional well-being, what does that mean? Do you have zones of regulation that are implemented into your schools? What could parents expect to see? How could they reach out for support if their child is struggling in that area? If you say that we value having um, 21st century buildings, we're already in the 21st century, we've been here for 23 years, I hope you do have 21st century buildings. But does your budget reflect your ability to upgrade those buildings to give students those learning spaces that they need? So we've talked about three or four different examples there. I would expect to see those things highlighted on your website. I would expect to see students learning in bright learning spaces and collaborating, not rows of chairs, but small groups and there's interaction. I would expect to see on the website children who are awake and smiling, looking like they're engaged, their teacher is saying something they want to hear. So if you take stock of your website, I will say it this way. Every time I'm around a seasoned administrator and they say, if I'm in my hallway and I see a piece of paper, what do I do? Oh, we got some seasoned folks in this room, right? So they pick it up. They pick up, they pick up that piece of paper because that affects how people see their school. As an administrator, I challenge you, when you return back to your campuses, 
look at your websites. I want you to look at if there's digital trash on your website. We are now in October, so if I'm still looking at back to school pictures on the home page of your website, or heaven forbid Valentine's pictures, because I've seen that happen, if there's outdated information on the website, get in touch with the person that's managing that website and say, hey guys, I really need your help here. Can you partner with me to help us help parents understand what's going on in the school? So not only are we talking about updated events on the homepage of your website, we're also talking about those key initiatives that you as a principal, you as a superintendent wanna push forward to your school. And I want to see them on the website. When you have an opportunity to talk to your Rotary or any other civic group in your community, I would hope that you're talking about those issues. That you're not just asking for money, you're talking about how you are delivering on the promises of your school district. This is the investment that your community makes in children. So I want you to talk about those things. And then finally, if you have an opportunity to distribute any kind of literature or anything like that, that those things are reflected in that. Not that we're just showing children collaborating and being happy, but we're showing results. This is the difference between outputs and outcomes, right? So it's great that you've got a beautiful building, but did science scores go up? Have ACT or SAT scores gone up as a result of these investments? I want you to talk about those things. We're not just gonna show it, we're gonna tell it, and we're gonna show the results of our efforts where our budget has um, invested in those key areas. So hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you. Invite anyone else who'd like to ask a question, feel free to come up. Um, I think we have one. <coughs> Thank you very much for uh, all of that you said today. This hasn't really been talked on too much. It was sort of referred in the, uh, the wonderful video. But kids during COVID had so much screen time and it was referred to, and we talk about trust. I feel like kids might have lost trust in one another a little bit because they didn't interact as much or as, as normally as they would have. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you, are there ways to build trust with the kids themselves, or is that something necessary? Is it something you, you talk about or think about? Or I guess that's the They didn't get the opportunity to practice. You know, when you look at, there are some parents that look at what, reflect on their experiences at COVID, and they were glad that schools opened back up. For me, it was an opportunity to slow down. We ate dinner around the table at the same time and had conversations. Imagine that. You know, when I think about what the federal government did in um, opening up the community el eligibility provision to allow for student meals to happen in congregate settings and, and taking them off. Like, those ideas where students in the summertime particularly can eat together and receive that lunch or that breakfast at no charge are so important. So when our students didn't have an opportunity to practice those skills, to be in community, because that's what school is about. It, it helps us with the ecosystem of learning how to be a good citizen. And so for all the time that our children were out of school, they missed that opportunity to model and participate in citizenship. And we've got to do our part in providing um, them structures, whether they're at home or civic groups that they're affiliated with to practice. We look at people in the eye when we talk to them. We put down our phones if we're eating meals together. So some of that is stuff that parents can do but in schools, when you're having students work collaboratively, that gives them the opportunity to practice that. I think there's definitely an opportunity for us to help our kids with our health and wellness mm -hmm. efforts. Uh, our schools having wellness rooms where they can come and really ask questions or engage with one another. Uh, recognizing that many of our kids came to school skipped kindergarten basically, were on Zoom, and then first grade, and then came into second grade. So the focus on literacy, but being able to do it in groups and in teams. Our ability to look at the social emotional, not everyone likes that, but the reality is a child who's not ready to learn is a child who will not learn. So looking at all the professional development necessary for us as adults to be more patient with our kids and uh, meeting them where they are at. 
not making assumptions of you're in a certain grade level, this is all that you should know, but building into the system, whether it's tutoring or after school play, connecting the school day to after school programs to make up for that lost time. And as we say about the pandemic, we were all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Mm -hmm. So the Dean spoke about many students who lost family members. That wasn't the experience of every child and every family, but for many of them, it wasn't just one family member. So focus on social emotional support is really important and redirection of resources uh, because being in pain is not something every person understands to communicate out. So we have to look for signs of that and we have to give ourselves enough time to differentiate for every child and every family. Thank you. Anyone else say a way on that? No, it's not. I'm good. I, I saw someone trying to ask another. Yeah. It's time for one more. It's two. We have two more. Sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Daisy. I'm a current student of Razier and an aspiring counselor. I'm also an employee with the Los Angeles Unified School District going on four years now. And my question is to Vivian. Um, you mentioned earlier about the 90% of parents who don't demonstrate interest in getting involved. So in my experience as a long-term substitute um, and in conversations with my colleagues, we've seen firsthand how difficult it is to get parents involved and you know, even to reach them. So what are some strategies or ways that you believe we as educators can approach that population of parents um, who are in the 90%? So besides making our phone calls and printing literature to you know, hand out at events, um, how do we change their minds? Uh, my personal experience in the 38 years that I worked in education was that they have to feel that we care about them and we have to understand what they're interested in. Uh, so every parent that I've met is interested in their own child. They may not be interested about the district-wide curriculum, K-12. They may not be interested about the bond measure. They may not be interested about things that aren't relevant to them. But if we want to meet with our parents, we have to find relevance in the conversation. And I would like to go back to what I said. During the period of polarization, there were that 90% I was talking about, individually, they would share with me their frustration. Individually, they would share with me that they're fearful, fearful of speaking up because they don't want to have the things happen to them that happened to me or some of their uh, administrators. So there were different reasons. But together, we didn't recognize how strong they could be. And the potential of numbers could have made a huge difference. So if I were to relive the last three months and the uh, last academic year, uh, it would have been an all call for parents to come and speak up and that not to fear anyone or anything. Um, you can't take that time back, but I think being relevant with where your child is at makes every parent want to be part of it. And they will share, when appropriate, what is happening that you may not even know about, mm -hmm. uh, that you need to take into consideration as an educator, and I'm so, fortunate to see you, Daisy, today as an educator who's got another 36 years to go. That's <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions from the audience? I, um, good evening. Um, first of all, I appreciate all the information, the depth, the awareness, your knowledge that you have in each of your respective fields. Um, I took something from every single one of you. Something resonated. But one of the things that I want to highlight is what Dr. Vivian mentioned uh, on kids who don't have a voice and parents who sometimes don't have a voice. Um, I resonate with that, remembering when I didn't have a voice and my parents are feeling that they didn't have a voice. Um, as a practicing school counselor and on my first year in my education leadership doctoral program, I bring that back to the students that I work in terms of giving them opportunities to have a voice. 
And I utilize that mainly because of the mentors that I had and the mentors that instilled that in me. So my questions to you is, reflecting back on your mentors and the traits that they instilled in you, what is this something that you take it upon to give others a voice in the current prof um, professions that you have to make sure that you carry that on? Thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. I think uh, I didn't just get a voice. I got a vest. Uh, when I was in the fifth grade, I had an ally experience where I was getting detention all the time. And was, you know, my teacher was like, we're gonna stay, we're gonna stick around. Well, uh, she made me, as you talked about the student panels, that brought me back to that thought that she made me, she stuck me in the classroom at lunch. She held me back during recess or lunch and she says, listen, you have a very engaging personality and when you start talking, you turn all the attention away from me and you start building your own coalition. She said, so this is what I'm gonna do. You're not staying back today. You're gonna get a pass, and I'm gonna send you to a conflict management class where I got to be on the playground during school. I got to leave a little, or, or I got to leave to go to recess a little early, so I was out there, and I started in the fifth grade understanding how to be an ally with an adult because she saw me and said, I'm not gonna give you a, a red card today, I'm gonna give you a vest and give you a voice in such a way. So I, and, and, and this is something that is a true story. Her husband's currently a superintendent. I see him every year at the AXA uh, Soup Symposium and I still have her number. And so that was in the fifth grade and I'm not fifth grade material anymore, so that was some time ago. But those relationships were built and they were built based off of trust. So my, my recommendation from, from that is to Understand that sometimes if you can give somebody who is acting out or somebody who is, uh, you know, a little different, somewhere they can shine and share the stage, I think that that can be a really, really powerful weapon on how to turn somebody from a chronic detention kid to a student body president one day. You see what I'm saying? And uh, we, we are a bit over our time. However, if we do have this one, if we have one last quick question. Great, here. Yeah, thank you for uh, for being here. Uh, I just found that really amazing. I um, this is a comment in my question. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about you know the, the pain that the kids are feeling today, and I in my own experience, my my best academic experience was really a non traditional experience. It was uh, spiritual psychology, where I learned a lot of tools of consciousness and how to live and how to how to cope with different things. You know, we're talking about these um, these meetings with parents and and really going back to the kids like what's the you know I think about the tools that that we need in life you know the excavation of our childhoods and things that impact our lives forever you know as superintendents um, you know humility and gratitude and teaching uh, these sort of values uh, these true north values that really make a difference in people's lives. Um, now I'll get to the question. The question is, how do we sort of incorporate, if we're not already doing it, ways to teach our kids, and really or all of us, to be more conscious and to be, you know, have tools to navigate life in a different way? Because today, that's what I see the big issue. I see a, a lack of humility, um, you know, in these board meetings I hear about and our politicians on both sides of the aisle. Uh, a lack of gratitude, you know, those are the secret weapons in my view. So my, my question would be in our education system, how do, we, how do we build that in more? Are we building that in more? What, what, is, what does that road look like? So we have advisory periods uh, where conversations occur with the teacher and peers with one another. And sometimes it's perceived as, we're, as if we're taking academic time away. Why not spend another 20 minutes a day teaching math? But the reality is that's how kids learn to listen to one another, to speak to each other, to problem solve together, and not always rely on the adults to be the problem solvers. The best strategy around our educational system is that we're giving our kids the opportunity to learn how to think. And coupled with literacy, they then can pave their own journey to success 
and they know that they need one another in that journey. You cannot do anything alone. So lots of team activities, but also engaging in advisory periods, and there are curriculums, so it's not as if every person has to come up with their own, so that um, our belief systems, our hearts and minds, our commitments, our vision, our mission, and our care for our community is instilled into our classroom and not dealt with as if someone else, someone else's responsibility. And I don't think that it is somebody else's responsibility. It's our community responsibility. Well, I certainly feel a lot smarter having listened to the board. together as well as Kine, Australia, and our events team, Rachel and Katrina and Simone on advancement. You're all terrific and thank you so much for everything you did today. And I, I want to thank all of you for being here, taking time, um, amazing expertise on the stage and Laurie also for your work on a trusted space. Um, just one final big round of applause for all the expertise. And as the Malbo Chair, it just my opportunity to again remind everyone that in the lobby of Waite Phillips Hall, there is a bronze plaque um, that carries Irving R. Malbo's um, name. And here is his advice from the past to the future, and I think we can take this away with us. Our goal is to develop standards to which others will aspire in the field of education. The future is a world limited only by ourselves. So take those words forward. And the way I end my classes is always with a fight on. So I'm going to end today with a fight on. Enjoy your um, reception, the drinks and food, and please interact with our experts. Fight on, everyone.